So yeah, um, welcome everyone to the fifth Bar HR updates. I think at some point during today's um, conversation, I would love for Kathy and Jacob to give us a walking tour of the house, which actually, if you want to, Jacob, do you want to start with that now or are you too busy? Are you guys in a good spot or Kathy, can you walk it around? Give everyone a quick tour of the house because uh, they're staying in the house that we can receive earth regenerators and earth regeneration friends to like Benji, for example. <laughs> yes, Benji, we're waiting on you. <laughs> Jacob, would you like to give us a quick tour of the house? I can definitely try. I mean, I'm on, on my laptop, but I'll do my best. So here, this is probably the coolest place of the entire house, which is the porch. Hi, with Kathy. lots of space where you can sit outside, a garden over here that leads into a straight up forest that you can walk through. Um, and the funny thing is that when you look over here, there's a wall. And beyond that wall, that's Joe's backyard. So yeah. if he comes out the back, we can literally wave each other, wave at each other, which is amazing. I just waved at um, <laughs> <laughs> This is our amazing kitchen where we're gonna be cooking up a big lunch today as an inaugurational thing, um, right after this call basically. And then we'll have a big event afterwards with Alpha explaining complexity and water here in Barichara, which will be super interesting. And at yeah, margaritas. we had margaritas place exactly with a big dining room. Um, oh, yeah, of course, another big highlight here in these houses are always the showers. Because, of course, it's always so warm here that you can shower outside always. So these are our showers. When it rains, it rains, but well, you're going to get wet anyways. So I <laughs> suppose it doesn't matter too much. And finally, well, I'll try and show you one of the bedrooms, I suppose. Um, no, it doesn't really work. So this is where we sleep. Um, one bed, I'm up there. And there's two more rooms just like this one over in, um, yeah, in the rest of the house. Exactly. This is the paradise that we get to live in. Awesome. Thank you for that, Jacob. And for those who can't tell, um, uh, Jacob is actually tall enough that um, you would actually probably be seeing everything from like a little bit lower than his perspective. Um, he's definitely the, the person who can reach things on the high shelves for all of us. <laughs> um, well, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see a few more of you have scraggled in while Jacob is getting a tour of the, the house, the guest house, the volunteer house. What's it called? Casa de Gallo? Another plan? Casa Gallo? Yeah, I mean, my plan was to just call it Casa Bosque again, but it is true. There's so incredibly many roosters here that you have to call it Casa de Gallo. I, it's really ridiculous. Everything that can somehow get into a rooster shape exists in rooster shape here. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I think you may, be, you may be referring to the Guacharacas, right? <laughs> Uh, Chad, by the way, that your mic is on and there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, for those who don't know, we have a special bird here, kind of like a pheasant that's called Guacharaca. And if you come into this territory, you will know this bird because they're sort of like six of them are always together and they're obnoxiously loud chatting to each other. Which I think is where the name comes from. And um, yeah, you might even hear them while we're on the call today because they just come around at, at random times. Um, well, thanks for that tour, Jacob. Um, I would love to, uh, yes, obnoxiously <laughs> loud like some humans. <laughs> I don't know who I might be referring to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would love to, to get started today um, by sharing that one thing that's happening, and you'll see it in the presentation part, is that there is a, a new focus of work arising for the next maybe two months up until the, the beginning of October. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And I think it will reveal how, um, how we're starting to practice navigating one really um, 
sort of complicated and multifaceted issue, which has been, what is the relationship between people who come here for the short term and people who are here for the longer term and people who live here and people who are from here? And in this web of depth, because so much of our work is deeply community oriented, that, um, that actually figuring out how to navigate that is just gonna continue being a process for quite some time. And we have a really nice welcoming committee that includes Jacob and Kathy and Penny, who have been organizing and creating materials to help people who are gonna be coming here. Uh, but also having the house set up that Jacob just showed us, which was really the beautiful work of Kathy um, collaborating with our neighbor, Claudia, who's the owner of the house, to arrange for that house to be secured. Um, has been just a process throughout the last month or so when they were in another house that was less good and Kathy's sense of needing sunlight really helped pull her into getting this house to open up, which is the really beautiful one. So we're in a really nice space now. Um, so what I'd love to do now is just spend um, a few minutes sharing a presentation to show you some of what's going on here. And then we can have some discussion afterwards. And so let me just jump right into that right now. Here we go. So, oh wait, I always have to close this first or else I can't see. There we go. So the first thing I wanna share with you is this picture which was taken last Thursday afternoon was a really special moment. Some of you may remember that last year in October, this tree, which is a native tree called Seba Barigona, which is at risk of extinction and only exists in the nearby Chicamocha Canyon, that this tree was rescued from a hostel where the people running the hostel needed to move out and the owner of the building wanted to cut it down before having new people move in. And so Sebastian Meisner, who's another earth regenerator, he and I came to the rescue and um, excavated this tree and transplanted it to the food forest in the Bioparque. And what happened last Thursday with this young man you see in the picture, for me, it exemplifies what the food forest is all about. Because that young man, is from this territory, he's a campesino youth from here. And when he was a high schooler, he was part of the group of high schoolers that came to the Bioparque six or seven years ago and did a number of community projects. And pretty much without exception, every young person that's now in their earlier mid twenties, who was a high schooler then, when I see them, they just have this sacred deep connection with the Bioparque. Now he's actually wearing a shirt from the local government because he works in the city's planning office. And the reason that he came to the food forest was because Camila, one of the founders of the Bioparque, brought him up to, uh, to inspect and improve a concrete ditch we're gonna dig across the road to divert rainwater into our food forest system. And we needed the planning office to approve it. So he came representing the planning office. And the whole time he and another guy from the planning office are standing out in the road, inspecting the project. And I'm standing up by the stone wall, telling them what we're doing. And, and I invite them in three or four times. Would you like to see the water retention system we've built? Would you like to see how we're reforesting it? And they're like, no, no, that's fine. We'll stay out here. And then somehow it comes up that we have a Seba Barigona, which is a famous local tree, famous because it's nearly extinct and even the local people don't know it. So this young man has never seen a Seba Barigona before. And when he hears that we have one, it's like he's got springs on his feet. He jumps over the stone wall and comes in and then kneels beside the tree and you can see the look on his face. He's touching the sacred tree and he understands how important it is. And can you believe he's never seen one? He's, he's actually probably a descendant of the Guane people. Someone local to this territory has never seen this tree and he's seeing it because we protected it in our sanctuary in the food forest. And so I just wanted to share this story with you because for me, this is what the food forest really is. It's a place of healing, connecting, and remembering to connect between the work on the land and the work in the community. And so when we brought someone from the local government to approve a concrete ditch, we didn't know that this moment was gonna happen. But when this moment happened, it was obvious that this is the real work. And so I just wanted you to see this picture. I quickly snapped the photo while he was kneeling there so I could send it to Camila and Vicky. And Camila was brought to tears when she saw it because it was just, she cares so much about the young people of this region. And so I just wanted to share that with you. And then I also want to share that you can see the tree does not have any leaves. That's because the Ormiga colona, the leaf cutter ant, keeps climbing up there and eating all the leaves off. 
And so after this photo was taken, you might notice there are no leaves. I took this picture down in the lower left the next day. And then five days later, I took the picture in the upper right. And I just want you to see how quickly the, the Seba Barigona is growing. I have another picture from yesterday that's even bigger. Um, and so I just want you to see that in just five days, this tree that is well adapted to the area is just crescendoing with life. And I wanted to just share this moment with you because having a nearly extinct tree that is protected in this way and then getting to see it is actually quite special. And most of us are not connected enough to our local ecology and biodiversity that we don't get to experience this. But here, every time I go to the, to the Bio Parque, the first thing I do is I walk over to the Seba to see how its leaves are doing. I just go and say, how's my little friend? And it's an amazing personal relationship. So I just wanted you all to see that. Okay, over the weekend, there was a big community event that happened where local craftspeople demonstrated their art. And um, these were some photos that I took when we were at the event. And one thing to know is that the Guane people of this territory have been famous for centuries for their textiles and their weaving practices. And this man on the left is the grandson of a master weaver who made this special kind of basket. And when he passed away, the grandson decided not to go to college and instead to stay home to live in his grandfather's house and continue the tradition. And so here he is happily making baskets. What you can't see in the picture is the giant grin that he gave to Penny and me just a moment before going back to his work when I snapped the photo. I said, would it be okay for me to take your picture? And he's like, sure, and he just kept going. And I just wanted to share with you how powerful it is to see a young person who chose not to go to the city, who chose not to go to college, instead feeling like these traditional practices are more important. And this is something that is just a really profound thing that, you know, you only experience it by knowing the people. I've met this guy before, and so I know a little bit about him, and I understand how important it is that he's here. And so I just wanted to briefly share that story. Also, um, the cultural event shared the exploration of local food. Now, I'm from Missouri in the Midwestern United States, which is, you know, jokingly called steak and potatoes country. Well, here we don't have steak and potatoes. Here we have goat and yucca, but it's otherwise basically the same idea. So what happened was at this event, different campesino families came and brought their own wood and set up their own grills and did like a barbecue competition. They were just like cooking their food and you could go up and try it out. And for the vegetarians in the group, I apologize. Um, but for those who are meat eaters, you can appreciate how yummy this is. And regardless, this is a, I would call it a traditional campesino practice, but not a traditional indigenous practice because the cows and the goats were brought by the conquistadors and by the Spanish uh, colonizers, but they've been a major part of Colombian history for the last 300 or 400 years. So while this may not be an indigenous cultural practice, it is an important cultural practice of the territory and was part of the event that was happening. And so I just wanted to share it with you. So you have a flavor of the local culture. In the meantime, a major focus of work has been maintenance and improvement of the Centropic agroforestry system. And what I want you to see here is, this is a little bit of work I was doing one day where it's taking a pickaxe and pulling some of the invasive grass and then stacking it as a kind of green, um, green uh, compost or mulch along the lines of the plants that are planted in this system. And what was really important about this is that this is a, a project that's a community project, but I'm responsible for its maintenance. And I've been neglecting it because I've been too busy. And in the last week, we really started doing the work of beginning to restore the maintenance that had fallen behind. And so as we began this work, it just became more and more intimate how those of us doing the work can relate to this space. So here's one of the pictures of the work that we were doing. This one's about seven days old, six or seven days old. And this one's maybe three or four days old. That's Jacob on the left and that's Penny more in the center. And you can see how there are lines of plants and then there are lines of sticks that are gonna grow into baby trees and then more lines of plants. And what we're doing is just gathering the mulch and cycling it directly from the land next to the rows as part of the way that this centropic agroforestry system is set up. It's sort of like gardening to create a forest. And having grown up in my mother's garden, it's really a special thing to be gardening and growing trees um, to create an agroforestry system in this way. 
So by just doing this daily maintenance work, we're maintaining a community project and getting to know how Centropic Agroforestry works and really getting to know, like as Penny has said from her work on this, this lane that she's working in, this row, is that the quality of the soil changes every few feet and you develop a tactile relationship to it by just coming back every day and working in the land. Another thing that's happened is that we've announced our next workshop. Taller is the Spanish word for workshop. So Taller de Agricultura Centropica, Enfocado en Huerta. What this means is that we're having, we're organizing a centropic agro, agriculture workshop focused on community gardens. Huerta literally translates as orchard, but it's the word that's used as a replacement for garden here in Colombia. Huerta is like the place where you grow your food. And so the important thing about this is that in the first week of August, we're having our next workshop and right now people are enrolling for it. And the focus of this one is that there is a community garden that was set up during the pandemic back in 2020. And that currently provides subsistence uh, food resilience for about 16 families. And so the focus of this next workshop is to invite the local neighbors and then also those from the larger territory after interest from local neighbors has been met to come and learn how to do centropic agroforestry with a focus on continual food production, producing beans that'll grow in a month, um, yucca that'll grow in a year, fruit trees that'll grow in five or six years, and wood for construction materials and other things that grow on timescales that are longer. And so this is a different kind of centropic agroforestry system in a different part of the territory. And the workshop is gonna happen from the 3rd to the 5th of August. And um, one of the important things about this is we set a price of 400,000 Colombian pesos, which is about 100 US dollars. But people can actually request to join with, by sharing some of their labor and helping with maintenance of the project afterwards by bringing some of the estimated 7,000 plants and seeds that we'll plant during the workshop, or that um, we can actually cover some of the costs with donations that have been received through fundraising, through the crowdfunding work that we've been doing for the Barichara Fund. And so this is just another project that's um, right now people are enrolling and that's gonna happen in about a month and that is already in process. Also during the weekend, an Earth Regenerator who's here with us, Alpha Low, organized a circle of generosity, sometimes also called um, a marketplace of offers and needs. That was held in Margarita's house last weekend on Sunday. And so you can see that there was a flyer created in Spanish, Circulo de Generosidad. And a lot of people came to this event and started sharing what they had to offer to the community and what they'd like to receive from it. And one thing that grew out of that is a woman named Carolina requested help in her garden. And so Jacob who's here on the call is organizing a work crew of Earth Regenerators members to come and work with Carolina in her garden tomorrow. So if you'd like to know more about that, you could talk to Jacob while he's here, unless he happens to be business, unless he happens to be too busy cooking lunch because <laughs> he's, he's uh, working in, uh, at the moment to prepare lunch while we're also having this, this call. Another thing that's happening today is that it uh, turns out I'm actually not going to be able to do this with Alpha, so he's going to end up doing it on his own. Um, but this afternoon, there's another talk about watershed restoration and the work we're doing here. And this one is going to be um, just another opportunity for sharing knowledge between those who come here from the outside and the local people who are concerned about water, which is a major theme for us. And so this is something happening this afternoon, so I'll have more to report on it later. But I just wanted to let you know that these kinds of activities are organized and maintained by a weekly calendar um, that the, the local welcoming committee and work group maintain, and that they're just keeping activities ongoing uh, as we go about the rest of the territorial work. Another thing that happened earlier this week is, for those of you who remember, or if you don't remember, there's a piece of land called Las Albercas, which is in the distance in this picture. It's the land off there in the distance which is the land that we've been raising money to purchase and set aside as a community project for the Barichar Ecoversity. And the ability to buy the land has come into question because uh, of things that have happened on the crypto market and things that have happened in the housing market in California with a donor who had offered to donate the money to buy the land. And so one thing that I did this week was I walked to the land to just ask the land, what did it want and what did it need? And I wanted to offer pagamentos, which 
from Spanish literally translates as payments, but is actually better translated as ritual offerings of gratitude in the indigenous languages. It's much more, that's much more the meaning of it. I wanted to go to Las Albercas and offer these offerings of gratitude to the land while all of this uncertainty remains. And as I was walking, I found this little baby cactus. And I thought, how perfect to bring the gift of water to the land in the body of a plant that holds water during the dry season. But then as I kept walking, I found more baby cacti. So I just, and this normally doesn't happen. I've walked this path many times. And as I'm walking, I'm finding baby cactus plants on the ground and gathering them in my hands and carrying them to, to the land. And then I arrived at one of the birthplaces of water, what's probably the most, most significant place, the most sacred, significant sacred site on the land, where there's this large nacimiento or birthplace of water. And it was at this site that I felt that I would make my pagamentos, my gift offerings of gratitude. And so I lovingly cleared a little bit of the grass that was there and made a space for a small cactus garden. And there were five cacti that I found from three different native species. So you see there are three of one species and one each for two of the others. And prepared this little gift offering space. You could think of it as like a living altar or as a living ceremonial site where the plants themselves become the guardians of the water. And then afterwards, I took the grass that I had cleared from the ground and made a circle around the baby cactus plants. Now, the thing that I wanted to express by sharing this story is that there's a part of this work that is about rediscovering how to live in an indigenous life way. And part of this is recovering and maintaining indigenous practices while also seeking connections to the sacred and connections to the land. So for me, this little act of walking in silence to a sacred site on Las Albercas and bringing these cactus plants and then preparing this little space was an act of connection to the sacred that helps me find clarity during times of uncertainty and confusion. And I feel like with so much happening in the world that creates confusion, that this ability to rediscover deep connection and to maintain it, it's always been important, but I feel like it's just gonna get more and more important as we move forward. So this was what leads me to sharing something that's happening in parallel that there's a larger earth regenerators context in which all of this work is playing out, which includes that we have a learning journey in earth regenerators that I'm a co-host of, along with Mitty and Kathy who are here on this call and several others in earth regenerators. And every Saturday we host a webinar and then a series of community calls. We're entering into the fourth week, we're in the third week now, so the first webinar was on living into the design pathway for regenerating earth. The second one was about being the weave, about learning to feel ourselves as a human tapestry of living relationships. Then the third one, which happened last weekend, was called How Disruption Makes Us Stronger, which really explored our body's physiological response to stress and trauma and how we navigate changes to become more agile and intelligent together or that break us down and traumatize us and degrade our abilities to respond in the future. And this Saturday, we're preparing a fourth webinar called Becoming Intimate with Collapse. And I wanted to share this with you because even though it's technically work in the global community, it's actually work that prepares people for the kinds of things we want to do in the ecoversity. And there's a continual flow of relationships between people who enter the learning journey or different learning journeys that we have, people who become donors and supporters of our work, people who join other activities like the Bioregional Catalyst work, which was ignited by Benji, who's here on this call, and that several of you are, are active participants of, to create learning exchanges from one bioregion to another. And so these learning journeys are just a reminder that there's a continual flow of activities that connects the global platform to whatever's happening locally that goes well beyond these weekly updates. And that this process that's unfolding right now is unleashing the transformative capacities of the participants in the learning journey, causing some of them to want to come here and become part of our work and visit us during the time that they're in the learning journey or afterwards. And this web of relationships back and forth 
just grow stronger each time we do a new learning journey. So I wanted to share this with you as part of what's happening in Barichara, even though it's not in Barichara. And that's because for the rest of the time, what I wanna really focus on is how we are catalyzing what happens here in Barichara to create learning opportunities in the rest of the world and how to form relationships with the rest of the world that can help transform what we're able to do here in the territory. And so one thing that we've been creating from the beginning of this project two and a half years ago is a living laboratory of regenerative economics. And as we've talked about in previous updates, the local leadership here in Bari Chai is creating a territorial foundation. And there's a network of local regenerative projects that are very diverse and ongoing. And also in our efforts to establish and to grow the Bari Chai Ecoversity, we've created a pledge community of people who donate $1,000 to supporting the purchase of the land for the Ecoversity and for our educational activities. And now we're continually weaving all this work through ecological connections here in the territory and also social connections between us here and people around the world. And what I wanna focus on now is what's happening with this pledge community. Because we had our first gathering of the pledge community this morning and people have been joining the pledge community for about three weeks now or maybe a month, but we hadn't gathered together to, to begin getting to know each other until just a few hours ago. And one thing that we've been talking about is that there's a very unique moment that's gonna happen really soon. And that is that in the world of information communication technologies um, and web three aspects of kind of the next generation of the internet with cryptocurrencies and alternative finance, uh, types of economics and finance, that there are two really big events that are about to happen. One's called the Cosmoverse Conference September 26th through 28th, which will be in Medellin. And then the DevCon Bogota event for Ethereum, October 11th through 14th. What's important is that these are two really big cryptocurrency events. And both of them have not physically happened in the last two years because of the pandemic. So this is the first time in three years that people are gathering. And it just so happens that both of them are in Colombia and they're close to each other in time. And this caused us to realize thanks to the, the insights of Antonio, who is here on the call with us today. Antonio is also a member of the pledge community, that he said, we could have a regenerative finance satellite event in Barichara that's sandwiched between these two big events. And if we did this, we might be able to bring people working in regenerative finance from all over the world to join us in Barichara and to come onto the land and feel for themselves what land-based regeneration is really like to contextualize and inform how they do their work with cryptocurrency and technology and the governance tools that a lot of communities are working with right now. And so this has become such a powerful idea that we're now beginning to plan a regenerative finance event. And Antonio bought an airline ticket and it's gonna arrive in Bogota on Sunday and is gonna join us here in Barichara on Monday. So next week he's gonna be here with us. And we formed a local team that's already beginning to plan out how we can launch this regenerative finance event at the end of September and beginning of October. And so this causes me to wanna to talk a little bit about the pledge community, because when we first came up with this idea for the pledge community, the idea was Los Albercas is in danger and we need to raise money. Could we ask people to make $1,000 donations to help us secure the land and to help us set up ongoing educational programs. Well, that was a nice idea. And then the idea came up, maybe we should create a crypto token for, for doing this, just to see how it attracts and engages people from the regenerative finance world. And that caused us to realize that this pledge community is actually a, a laboratory or a sandbox for the design of participation of how we can create together. And we confirmed that this morning when 12 members of this pledge community gathered together because not all of them could make it to the call. And we shared our personal desires to be in the pledge community and what we hope to get out of it. And we felt a resonance to just cutting through all of the bullshit of cryptocurrency and finding what is genuine and authentic about collaboration using internet tools that can enable us to catalyze and transform on the ground work. So this pledge community has already raised $19,000 
for the Bar HR Ecoversity, because each member of the community can pledge in increments of $1,000. But they're doing something else. The pledge community itself represents a global team that can catalyze different networks. They can work with people who work with cryptocurrency. They can work with people in regenerative economics. They can work with people in community health and well being, in facilitation and trauma healing, because we have a, a diversity of capacities for the people in the pledge community who feel their way into and connect to different networks. But also, we have a local team to organize the activities for this regenerative finance event, which had our first meeting when Jacob and Chad, Penny and myself sat down together on Sunday morning. When we have our next meeting, we'll include Kathy in it because she's part of the, the welcoming committee. And we have other people who are coming like Antonio coming next week, who are gonna help us manage this, this local team that is gonna guide the work between now and the event in the beginning of October. But also this pledge community is interwoven with earth regenerators because about half of the pledge community are earth regenerators members and half are people who are from different networks and different communities. So we're beginning to interweave with other communities with this pledge community. And they have a diversity of skills and perspectives. So people who join the pledge community will be designing together with a diverse set of backgrounds to enable us to do really creative things. And that means this pledge community is a living lab for regenerative finance. And so I wanna express that the ecoversity already exists through the existing activities here on the ground. But these kinds of distributed global patterns, like the global pledge community for the Bar HR Ecoversity, is also part of the Ecoversity. How do we learn to create capacities for regenerative finance? How do we create bioregional investment platforms? How do we manage territorial governance? What are the relationships between global and local? How do we design for participation in various ways? How do we humanize the technology tools that tend to be way too machine-like and not nearly human enough? And on and on. And so this pledge community is a living lab for regenerative finance. And so I just wanna let you know that those of you who haven't joined the pledge community, uh, let me know if you'd like to talk more about being involved in it. And it's gonna remain as part of the work that we're doing here in Barichara throughout the next several months. And honestly, I think ongoing beyond that for quite some time. This way of maintaining innovative patterns across the world while anchoring work locally and protecting the local work with territorial governance, in our case in Barichara with a territorial foundation and a wisdom council comprised only of local people that can collaborate with the global earth regenerators community and other online or distributed networks. That we're exploring how to do this in earnest with the pledge community right now. So what this means is that while we're raising funds for the Ecoversity, that's really nice, but not very interesting because it's just like a mechanism. The more we gather our diverse capacities, the more capacities we have, including the capacities for raising funds. But if we don't know how to govern ourselves differently, I don't know that that matters too much because then we'll just create another old model institution that's not gonna serve us in the future, which is why we're, looking at how the raising of funds and the coordinating of efforts can prepare us to receive other earth regenerators. So Antonio, as I already mentioned, is coming next week, but there are also conversations about how the earth regenerators fund is collaborating with the Regen Foundation. And this is connected to the earth regenerators fund and its governance. And so there are people's invo people involved in that work and also people like Benji, who's here on the call, who are doing bioregional weaving and looking at how to how to learn and train others in this catalyzing and weaving of bioregional territories, that all of this work is preparing us to receive and maintain these exchanges more robustly than we have in the past. And of course, we're organizing the local team for the regenerative finance event, which is growing in capacity with the pledge community as, as a, an online partner to the local team. And that means that we're gonna be growing the pledge community as more people learn what we're doing and start to get involved, which means back to the beginning, we'll be raising more funds for the Ecoversity in addition to everything else. And so while the, all the while this is happening, those of you who are familiar with the governance processes of the Earth Regenerators Fund, that the Earth Regenerators Fund is evolving in parallel with this. And there's been a question for several months now, 
what is the relationship between the ER fund and the bar HR regeneration fund? And I think what we can see is that we now have social learning processes that will make this clear. It's not fully clear yet, but in the next few months, we're gonna learn a lot about how to clarify, distinguish, integrate and separate and strengthen the relationships between the Earth Regenerators Fund, which is globally focused, and the Bari Chara Fund, which is territorially focused in our bioregion here in Colombia. And of course, the local activities always continue as this is happening. So the Centropic Agroforestry Workshop is gonna happen, the work in the Bio Parque, the work at Oriental Lagua, the other activities that are maintained by the Earth Regenerators who come to visit us, all these things are just gonna keep happening while this pledge community and this regenerative finance event emerge in the next couple of months. And so that's what I wanted to share. Love to have a conversation with all of you about this and just see what's bubbling up. What questions do we have? What, um, what uh, feelings do we have about potential opportunities or ways to weave and connect the different pieces? Um, so I just love to open it up. And maybe if we can use the, the hand raising option from the reactions on the bottom of the screen, go to reactions and raise your hand. Just let me know if there are any questions or uh, inspirational feelings that are bubbling up for, for any of you at the moment. Mm. I'm just soaking it all in. <laughs> One thing I'm curious about is, um, since there aren't any questions coming up, is if either Penny or Jacob or Kathy would like to share any of your perspectives about all of this or any part of this or other things that I didn't cover. Um, I'd love to just invite you if you'd like to share anything. Oh, and Chad as well, because Chad is also here locally. So if any of you would like to share. Jacob, come on in. <laughs> um, well, just an update on the podcast, which really that should yeah. be uh, Jacob sharing. Jacob has taken a lot of initiative to get the recordings that we've already made, thanks to uh, Charles's excellent recording equipment and a lot of uh, a lot of um, interviews that have already been done and are stacking up. And Jacob has taken the initiative to um, learn. To do the boring work, basically. Do, do the, the editing and finally get it out there after all of the fun part where you talk with intelligent people is, is gone, yeah. That's right. But we've got it out now, which is awesome. Um, it's not necessarily Bari Char specific, but if you want to read more about our ideas behind it, um, I put up a post, I think, this morning or yesterday morning um, on Earth Regenerators because it's supposed to be the Earth Regenerators podcasts and kind of modeling on, I think, what Doomer Optimism and Steven has been doing there. They basically just say, anybody that's been on this podcast can then go on and interview another person. So what we would like to do is to basically just say, anybody that's in Earth Regenerators and part of the community can interview somebody. And that's then basically, yeah, confirmed that that's okay and in alignment with the values of earth regenerators by some sort of committee and on it goes so that's what we've been working on and i'll also add that on the um on the biogas digesters thanks to margarita and her connections with red bio Coal, uh, which is the network of uh, biogas in colombia um, that we have um, connected with lilian who uh, has not only all the materials that are needed to, um, to create a biogas digester, but also um, the expertise and, and the know-how. Um, we also have a contact who is a local farmer, her name is Somara, um, and she has a biogas digester that um, she and her husband and, uh, and a team uh, installed on their land two years ago, which is working just fine. Uh, we put, we paid a visit there and we saw the awesome uh, farm that she has, which is also partly due to the fact that that um, superior 
Biol or uh, fertilizer from the digester is nourishing her land and um, they do a significant portion of their cooking with the gas from that uh, digester. And this also connects with another aspect of Margarita's work, which is that she supports farmers to uh, do a step of adding value to their, um, to their uh, produce and also lengthening its shelf life by, um, she helps people to create um, dehydrators out of old refrigerators. And uh, so Rafa, who's very expert with that technology came along and was helping to um, with that process. Oh, and, um, and we're working towards a Minga, which is a community work day um, that's going to involve creating first the trench in which the biogas digester will sit. And, um, and then we'll be actually constructing one. And this is on that same property where Joe was talking about with the, the multiple families that have um, the garden plots there. Uh, the community garden farm, actually, um, which partly, well, it's in Guane, and um, part of the operation is that Paul, a friend of ours, uh, who was at the solstice ceremony, a big part of the solstice ceremony, Paul um, is, uh, has quite a bit of livestock there, and their manure will be the source. Or thank you both for those updates. And I see that Mitty has been doing a lovely job of gathering some of the links and putting them into the chat so that you can go and read more about those if you like. Are there any other questions or comments or would Chad or Penny like to share as well? Well, Jacob, I thought maybe you could talk about the Spanish exchange, the tables that you set up because it's so fun. And I think people who are coming might really want to hear about that. Uh, sure. Um, I thought that maybe people would want to react to Kathy's awesome biodigester news first, but if there's nobody else that wants to talk about that, sure, I can talk about the other things that I've been up to. Um, so I think about two or three weeks ago, we were doing a hike to Guane, which is a small town nearby, and we thought, wouldn't it be really cool to have a place where we could all practice Spanish and get to meet the local people? And so I remembered the time when I was volunteering in Tokyo in a language cafe doing exactly that. You could practice languages and at the same time get to talk with people that you would otherwise never meet because you would be living in such different spheres of life. But since everybody here wants to practice English and every foreigner wants to practice Spanish, everybody comes. And we have basically started a WhatsApp group uh, that organizes meetings every Tuesday and Saturday evenings. Right now, it's been way too successful with the local people. So <laughs> usually we have two or three times as many Spanish native speakers as English native speakers working on that um, <laughs> uh, to come to these intercambios, these exchanges, and just talk with each other and help each other out mutually uh, without any money just people show up uh, in a cafe that has opened stores for us, buy a little tea, a little cake or something like that and talk with each other. Uh, and it's also benefiting that local business, Baba. Exactly, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So- And it's been awesome. Very, very fun. It Everybody has been has incredible amounts time. of fun. Yes, yes, <laughs> super cool. Awesome. So yeah, that's been one of the things that we've been doing. Penny still hasn't come, so- Please, please the next time, but no, <laughs> she's been very busy with other things. Um, and then another thing that I've been working on the last two weeks about is updating the regeneratebarchara.org website, because I think that was designed originally just to cover, cover Origen del Agua. And now, of course, we have lots of other projects going on as well. And coinciding with wanting to make a landing page for the regenerative economy, regenerative finance event that we might hold in between those two big cryptocurrency conferences. I thought it would be a great idea to update that website to reflect a little bit more the place that we're in right now. So Taylor, who's a friend of Charles, um, who came here a few days ago and I have been working on that, transferring some of the posts that we've put up on Earth Regenerators, creating an event calendar so that if we organize events, we can share basically like, yeah, just a what's it called, ICS file or something like that, or a public calendar with the local community 
updating the little articles that were written about Origen del Aqua. I've written some copy about the other projects that we've been working on so that if we have the landing page for this regenerative economy event, people can also check out the other things we've been working on and realize how much awesome stuff is going on here. And Jacob, could you give that name again of the website? Ah, regeneratebarichara.org. Very good. Um, thank you to whoever designed that in the first place. That's a pretty fancy website. Um, <laughs> never made yeah. anything like that myself. I'll drop the link into the chat. And the person who originally made that website, well, there were two originals. Eva Reitman was starting the project and then it um, grew to uh, include Gail Colm, Alan Lipshin, um, Vivek, uh, Ghani was also involved for a little while in that. And then it ended up becoming sort of the labor of labor of love, labor of frustration for Gail to complete it. And Gail ended up doing the lion's shares of the work to get it done. And a lot of the photography and video footage was Stefan Nomad, who was here staying with us for a few months last year, capturing a lot of documentary footage. And so, um, so we actually had a nice Earth Regenerators team last year working on that. And it's just been sitting unused for like nearly a year. Uh, so I, I'm curious, are there other questions that people have? Or, oh yes, Jan, please. Well, I'm curious about the group process with your with the pledge group, because it sounds like a, a new group and a fairly large group with a, a great and exciting and huge mandate. So I'm curious about the process of facilitating and decision-making and, and all that. So probably it's quite new, but you're still, but also sometimes this, the beginning sets a fractal for how the rest works. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, um, Pamela, did you want to add to that or should I answer that one and then come to you? Just want to be sure that. Well, uh, what I have to say is maybe, maybe connected, okay. um, uh, but go ahead, Joe. I, I'd rather hear what you have to say first. Okay. Um, what I would say is that um, initially what we're doing is, let's say, a typical pro-social startup process, which is in our first meeting, we start getting to know each other personally, and we start sharing our personal like motivations, intentions, and desires for being involved, for why we showed up, and then start looking from that, like that beginning, which is sort of a, a dialogue of mapping we begin to reveal why we're there and having that conversation and then start to cohere and clarify around a shared sense of purpose. And that that's the beginning of the process. And what I see growing from it will be, first of all, we made an agreement in our meeting this morning that we will, I, I asked each person who was there to share, would they like to set up a telegram group and shall we set up a private group on Mighty Networks in Earth Regenerators? So those who are in the pledge community can have a place to organize content and events and the other things that we do on Mighty Networks. And Telegram can just be for ongoing conversations and exchanges. And so that is being approved by the members of the group saying they want to do that. So I'm just waiting for more responses, but so far everyone has said yes. So I can already see that we're going to do that. And then what we'll begin to do is just identify together what rhythm do we want to have? Like how, of, how often would they like to meet do we need to set up more than one time zone for the different places around the world that people are? All of that will begin to become clear depending on how much people engage. There are some members of the pledge community that love what we're doing but don't have much time. And there are others who really want to just roll up their sleeves and go more deep. And so we'll have a period of maybe the next month or so where that will start to reveal itself. And then we'll, we'll find our way into a pattern of governance, which is, the way that the pro-social process works is, um, for those who are less familiar with it, it's basically continually evolving and adapting the group dynamic from moment to moment based on what's happening among the participants of the group. And so we'll co-evolve the governance using pro-social processes, uh, which means we can't say ahead of time what those processes will be because they'll be created by the group. And so what I anticipate is that with the group that's already gathering, just the, the people that were on the call this morning, I can see already that there is a strong bridge between those who are already in ER and those who aren't, and those who aren't come from diverse backgrounds, which just means we'll spend some time exploring what that shared space is to, to really find what is the strength of this collection of people. 
And what does this collection of people really want to do together as they become a functioning pro-social group? And then from there, it'll depend partly on who are the members of the pledge community and what they want to do. So, so that's just a question that remains sort of to be discovered in the process. And it's very early days. Um, so I hope that answers well enough for now, at least. And Pamela, on to you. What was your question that you had? Or your comment? Um, well, there are two things. One regarding the, um, man, I don't like speaker view, but uh, uh, one of them regarding um, the pledge and my, um, I'm, I haven't a fundraising bone in my body. I do not like asking people for money. And, but I presented this thing on behalf of C Cascadia, originally specifically thinking there would be enough people in Cascadia to support uh, a pledge. And we have four out of uh, 10 people thinking of $100 uh, contributions. Um, so there's a general invitation for anyone who wants to go on the ride and see how this works to, um, if you want to throw your hat in the ring, uh, just there is a com. I, I should repost. I am not good at this kind of stuff, so I'm guessing I have to repost the original invitation or the extended invitation, which now reframes it so that it's not to Cascadia, but a Cascadia invitation to the wider Earth Regenerators community to throw in their hat if they want to get um, in on the pledge. So there's that piece. And so I'll just message me or, or something if anyone is interested, but I will repost it and, and try to re-energize it. I'm, I've contacted Rachel for advice. Um, and the other thing I just want to bring to attention is that there is another piece of Earth Regenerators hanging out there <coughs> in the universe, uh, which is the website that uh, Vivek built that was to support um, the Design Pathway book um, launching and organizing around that, but it has not, um, so it is there but it is rather orphaned. And I don't think there is much knowledge of it. And I'm wondering if it's of interest to you, Jacob, to um, even reach out to Vivek and see if there is a way of, um, maybe there's there are resources that are planted in that site that could be migrated to another site where a similar kind of activity is, brought more to the fore and given an extra oomph. I'm not quite sure, but um, I'd invite you to contact him and see where that may work out so that there is an actual uh, life to the place. Yeah. And any notions on what the heck I should do to carry this collective pledge forward, you know, talk to me. Um, just one thing I want to briefly say before passing back to Jacob and Kathy is that um, what Pamela is talking about is that I gamified this, meaning I used game design principles to create a $1,000 pledge as a psychological anchor. $1,000 is a number that is significant enough to be a meaningful contribution, but small enough that a lot of people could either cover it themselves or with a couple of friends together could cover it with the idea being that um, we may or may not create something that anchors to the $1,000 pledge. You know, and there was an earlier post where I said, we may create a bar HR token, where there'd be some voting or something, we don't know quite what it is, because the pledge community would create it, that would be connected to the level of the pledge. So if you had five people create a pledge together, maybe they together get one vote if the group decides that voting is something that they would do, but it really depends on what the group wants. And on the other side, then actually playing the game of cooperation of finding enough people to raise $1,000 together engages more people in the, in the dialogue. And then the pledge community itself will decide, do we even care if someone gave more or gave less money for voting rights or other things? That's a decision of the pledge community. But those who pledge together will be members of the pledge community to participate in that, in that process. And this is sort of, to me, like 
if you don't pay for a gym membership, you don't go to the gym. And if people don't put more than just words into participating in the pledge communities process by saying, I'm gonna bring money or help try to bring money, that just that level of commitment is what makes the pledge community work, which is why it's sort of like playing a game in a way. And now I pass it over to, to Jacob and then to Antonio. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, about the website thing, actually Vivek, yeah, commented on the Earth for Generators post, uh, the podcast post saying that we should create a structure to manage these kind of common assets of Earth for Generators as a group as a whole, which I think is a really, really good point. And where actually what we've been prototyping here, I think, in Bagichara would probably be quite useful to create some sort of overall governance committee um, across Earth for Generators, which can then receive proposals. Um, and then based on those proposals, either create roles or committees to implement those proposals through probably a more hierarchical structure. Um, how this governance group permitting those proposals would act is a really big question, I think, because here it's really easy. We just have a consensus meeting, that's it. Um, across 4,000 Earth for Generators, that's a lot more difficult. Um, but yeah, one of those one of those common assets definitely is the earthforgenerators.org website, which honestly, I think we should use this domain name. So working on that website, definitely making it the home for the podcast, I think would definitely work out really well. So to just make another new tab for the podcast and start, uh, yeah, basically making it the home website of the podcast instead of the host that we have right now, which is Red Circle. Um, would work really well and then we can see i mean i think that since most of the activity is on earth for generators it's probably a good idea to mostly make the website something of a landing page with some basic information and then a funnel into earth for generators and into the book as it has been i believe working until now already um but yeah just using that domain name for the earth for generators podcast is definitely something that i would like to start working on and well not the next few days but three weeks when I come back from a Vipassana retreat. <laughs> yeah, Antonio, were you still here and you ha have something to share still? Or no? Yeah, I just, I hear all these themes popping up and I wanna make comments, but um, I, I do wanna synthesize them as well because we're already, uh, we're already doing the thing without naming it. And um, how do we, uh, do treasury management, how do we do uh, digital asset management, all these things are coming up and it is an actual need. So fortunately there are solutions that are getting better and better. So if you want to have a DAO to do a decentralized treasury management um, and if the question is like, do we do a token? Do we not do a token? The token does itself in terms of meeting the need that can't be crossed um, without it. So there's actually token engineering is, is a emerging science. There's a platform called common stack, which is basically how to do, how do you, it's a, it's a mathematical tool for modeling uh, community currencies and token economies. And I've uh, worked with them before in how to do like DAO integration. So, they also use Eleanor Ostrom's eight principles for, for how they do their design um, design management. So Common Stack is just a really cool team uh, that's been working on this for a very long time um, that has been platform agnostic in terms of uh, which blockchain they're using. And we're coming up to uh, this situation uh, with a website or where do you host somebody's running the servers. Uh, so if whoever's hosting the Earth Regenerators website or Mighty Networks goes down, we lose our communication tools and we lose that, uh, that, uh, those, those, um, that capital, that, that knowledge capital. So this is uh, just part of the framing as we move closer to this refi um, happening. And I've been meditating on this for, for two years since when the Earth Regenerators started in the spring of 2020. That's when the, the date and place was set for DEF CON in Bogota. And because of COVID in 2020, and I think they didn't 
explicitly say it, but 2021 had a lot of political turmoil. They also, I mean, you could say it was COVID, but uh, you know, it might not have been a very safe place to be hosting a global um, event in Bogota last year. So, and it also is influenced by like cultural um, signaling through events like Burning Man, where you have a lot of um, a lot of talk about living differently. <laughs> but how different are you living in your um, in your simulated poverty? So the idea is, can we come together, celebrate, and actually do Earth regeneration? So I'm thinking like th there was a Refi Summit in Seattle in uh, May uh, this year, hosted by a guy named Rex, um, and they did uh, uh, like a conference room with a stage panel, and basically brought in all of the leaders in the like what is comp like okay so if we if we're just focusing on putting carbon credits onto a blockchain and then using uh DeFi tools such as liquidity pools to be trading these on-chain carbon credits but is it actually solving a problem is it effective or is it a um, just another card game to play so we are transitioning into a bigger, broader conversation within the space and the industry as it as it emerges. And uh, this this festival is a time to play um, because that's the only way that we're going to find the real answers. So when I think of like, um, you know, there's there's so much potential for this ecoversity to be regenerating on the ground, but also regenerating hearts and minds through uh, digital education. And this is like one use case of an NFT, where if you have this token that represents either a class pass, um, what it really signifies is participation in a permissionless way due to the open nature of how the data is stored and secured and incentivized. So this is all to say that um, I've been thinking of this, uh, the hunter's moon on, October 8th, which is a Saturday. And I just want to get more clarity around timing because I feel like this is a little, I don't want to be pushing um, this event into a way where it, it becomes distorted and um, wondering how to build in more ceremony into this, into this festival. So I know that the cacao circle and, and you guys did like a fire um, thing before trying to anchor that that event into into the ground because since probably 2015 I think the crypto conference circuit has been nonstop it only stopped for a little bit during covid but ev all all around the world there are these conferences and you go to them and there's no sense of like how is this impacting real life and um, there's also an organization called Refi Spring. So they are actually a decentralized autonomous organization that got a grant, I believe, from Gitcoin. And Gitcoin is a, is a, is a funding platform uh, for public goods. So traditionally, it's been public goods are anything that can be used by, by a community. So for example, if software is a, is a, is a common good, so how do we fund public uh, open source software doesn't get funded. And uh, so Gitcoin is there because of that, but it's now become a home and a shelling point or a, a place for people who don't know where to go, they just end up there. Um, when you don't have a destination, it's everybody just defaults to the shelling point. So Gitcoin is, has become a type of like refi uh, funding platform. All the, all the people that wanna do regenerative projects um, using Web3 go, go there to ask for funding. And they've also been kind of doing more region themes. So we are right on the forefront of the region meme making. And, and that's what we have to be doing is to be occupying the mind space as opposed to occupying Wall Street. We're now occupying the campesinos, <laughs> the, the campo. Um, so those are just some of my ideas um, around the event. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, being there in person and really getting a little bit more um, uh crispness sharpness around the the offering but i think we have something really special here uh that's why i'm here because i think this is 
this is the most important thing um, that that we can be doing right now because I feel like we have to get this one right to get the future future sites up and running. But it's it just keeps building um, momentum on top of itself. And I'll 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 conclude with one more um, insight. I went to I had I had the pleasure of visiting Bali, 2018, and I went to the Green School to help work on a rainwater project uh, as well as participate in their uh, their curriculum. So they had a really I think it was like kind of based off the Montessori model, but uh, it's based it's student led learning. So I was a facilitator with these middle school kids and, and we're working on designing um, a rainwater intelligent rainwater harvesting system. And getting to see the green school is a really beautiful um, inspiration. I recommend uh, just looking online to see how they've integrated a, I mean, the, the architecture, they're using bamboo as a building uh, material to create these like cathedrals of, of, uh, of living. But they don't, there's no, how do you get the green school into um, everyone's like living rooms, so to speak? And I think that what this ecoversity represents and, you know, as long as the need is there, the land will eventually come onto our, our steward into our stewardship as Joe's already doing the offerings. So it's just a matter of time, but wondering how uh, to replicate this in, in all the fractals and all the bioregions. And uh, so it's cool to see the work that's happening in, in Cascadia. And um, noticeably, the conversation has shifted and has, um, I think, after the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, the uh, illusion, <laughs> the, the filters keep coming off, right? And then all the, the what this is actually bringing about is more space to discuss bioregional organization and administrative capacities, which is which is what we're doing. And what I am trying to add to the conversation in these crypto communities is saying, well, if we're building blockchains and we need to be organizing at the bioregional level, why don't we design bioregional blockchains? And that gives a full stack of sovereignty. And the way that they're designed is that they're all interoperable together. So we have a planetary pathway to creating a planetary internet at the bioregional level to do all of our local organizing. So that's the story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, thanks Antonio. And um, I see Benji has his hand raised and then Mitty. So Benji, on to you. Yeah, th thank you, Antonio. It's, um, oh, I see what you mean about this speaker view, Pamela. I'm going gallery. <laughs> um, I'm big enough this way. Um, so what I have to say is, is maybe too big of a conversation to bring in right now with like 19 minutes left. Maybe it can just be sort of a provocation, something for people to think about. But, but I'm thinking about the bioregional catalyst and our stage of development. Uh, we've got a bunch of people on the call here who are part of the bioregional catalyst. Um, and then there's also a bunch of people who are in Barichara. And I'm thinking about um, mutual opportunities, ways that we can sort of... Uh, yeah, support one another. Just to give you guys, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, a, a little bit of background of what's going on in the Bioregional Catalyst. We're exploring this idea of the Bioregional Apprentice, and then we're also sort of dipping our toes into creating some Bioregional Group incubators. So uh, Claire Atwell is, is the example I'm thinking of. We're having a, a session next Wednesday uh, where she's going to bring together, or she's going to present an idea that she has, or a plan for a gathering in a Cowichan Valley in British Columbia to uh, begin weaving some regenerative projects together. And it, it sort of looks a little bit like a bioregional learning center. Um, so, and she's not alone. There's several of us who are doing similar things. Uh, there's uh, several projects that I would call babies. And we are just trying to figure out, you know, what are the, the coherent um, developmental patterns that we can uh, begin to discuss and begin to lift up and highlight and clearly you all are, are learning so much in Barichara uh, and there's so much we can learn from you and I just I I've sensed that we are getting closer to the point where we can actually um, support you as well um, and so I, I'm just I'm curious uh, if people have ideas I, I'm sensing into that that's becoming more of what I'm thinking about moving forward 
And so this doesn't have to be something that, you know, we, we come up with an action plan now for, but I just wanted to socialize it at the very least. Um, and uh, if you have any ideas, uh, please reach out. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. One thing I want to say on that before handing on to Mitty is um, that I've had the idea from the beginning, meaning of the beginning of my time in Colombia and actually in the time when we were in Costa Rica before, that if we created what I initially called the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth and then Earth Regenerators was born and then Barichar Ecoversity as this local focused version, the idea of having a design school that learns how to regenerate bioregions. And so said in that way, what you're saying is just the natural continuation that what we're doing in Barichara can have a distinct focus on bioregional design in addition to what's happening in our bioregion to partner with the bioregional catalysts work to create a clarity of framework, just a framework of clarity. What would it mean to do design for bioregional regeneration and which diversity of locations should prototype it together, not just in one place. And by the way, this was the mission of the Regenerative Communities Network and that was the work I was hired by Capital Institute to do, but then for various reasons couldn't. And when I talked to John Fullerton a few weeks ago, it's now clear that Regenerative Community Network has spun out of Capital Institute, is no longer funded, and there are some key groups that are trying to do this, including Isabel Carlisle and Glenn Page and others we know. And the suggestion is beginning to be offered to them that they should house the Regenerative Communities Network within Earth Regenerators somehow, because we're actually doing what they need to be doing. So you can start to squint your eyes and see the pieces of a bioregional design school somewhere among the elements, not housed in one place or another, or, but somewhere among the elements. So it's naming that that is coming into being. It's just so damn big that it's hard to see it coming. Um, so I'm really glad you brought this in, Benji. Um, Mitty, on to you. Thank you. When I was a small girl, I used to spend hours with my mother's embroidery silks because however much she um, loved to keep them straight, they always got in a tangle. And I, I feel I'm sitting with a tangle of embroidery silks at the moment. And I'm not, just as I used to sit as a kid, I'm not clear which thread will help the tangle untangle and, and which will tangle it tighter. Um, I'm sitting with an absolute mass of questions. This afternoon, I'm going to be in a meeting with Jonathan and Penny and Rachel and Todd Youngblood to explore this idea that's been um, generated around a Vivero network, a, a, essentially, as I hear it, a kind of club for people who are um, drawn to Earth Regenerators to, to really become clearly identified as members of Earth Regenerators. And as you were saying, Joe, earlier, uh, become a member of the gym club and then have a, a clear voice in how the, the, the gym club gets governed. Um, but I sit with this question that I think was sitting on the table right at the beginning of the, um, the first meeting of the Earth Regenerators Fund when, when Joe invited us together. And it's actually only last October, but it feels a hundred years ago to me already yet. We've, we've traveled so many miles together. Um, what is the relationship between ER and Barachara? How do we find a way to work together so that we're not conflicting, we're not competing? Or if, if we are conflicting, we're doing it in the spirit of here's a creative tension. How do we sit with the tension? Um, I imagine Penny must be sitting in this sort of, you're, you're in a sense the embodiment of the tension and I love how you sit there still 
and calm. <laughs> and, and I'm so glad you're there. <laughs> and also kind of here within, I feel you so strongly within the Earth Regenerator community as a, as a very powerful, still, often really clear thinking presence. Um, I, I sit with the question, you know, I hear my beloved friend Pamela. Pamela and I have traveled so many different paths together in we, we've been together since childhood last year you know <laughs> and, and I'm barely an infant crawling and walking yet with you Pamela but I sit with this this uh invitation to join the pledge and everything in me wants to be with my friend Pamela in this pledge to support my friend Joe and and these wonderful people Kathy and Jacob and everybody else in in Barachara. And then I say, but here I am sitting in my local community in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, and I'm, I'm working on the ground to discover what is my bioregion and who is my bioregion and how can I serve in my bioregion. And now I'm being invited to join a Cascadia pledge to help Barachara, even as Denji speaks about Claire next week in Bioregional Catalyst, bringing forth her ideas for an ecoversity maybe in Cascadia. So all I can say is I, I, I just sit with this embroidery basket of, of silk threads and I'm bemused. I know, I, I know there are no other people than the ones in this room that I would rather be with trying to, <laughs> to work with these threads, but I am bemused today. And Jacob, I'm thrilled to hear about the podcast. It's wonderful. It was that and your earlier post about what's going on in Barachara, you're a real gift to our community. And it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to my bemused state. Uh, just to say, Mehdi, I think that metaphor is very apt, and I think we can all feel it. <laughs> On to you, Pamela. Oh, uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, I really like that. Uh, and I have, I'm not much of an embroiderer, but I went through a spell and I do have that clump of mixed threads that will not be untangled. But what I, what I did discover while you were talking about was that I really like that clump of untangled threads. Like I, it's not something that I'm throwing away because it is intrinsically kind of beautiful. So to carry that metaphor forward, I really surrender to, I do not know the fuck. Like, I don't know anything. And I am simply surrendering to an energy which I feel is worth exploring. I only have enough fiat currency that experiment, which I'm really keen about, but um, with anybody else who's curious, and I just wanted to make notice that we now have five pledges filled and are only looking for six more people. Uh, and I have no idea what that means, Joe, what the implications are, if that totally screws up the whole token thing. And I, I don't know for what. So if you want to pull the reins in on me, you can, you know, give me a call and we can talk about it. And I'll have my people talk to your people. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, um, but here we are. And uh, so if anyone wants to just mess up with few, a few more threads, um, yeah, I'll bring that thing to the top of Earth Regenerators where it will last probably 45 minutes before it slinks to the bottom again. Uh, that's it, thanks. Um, I just wanted to add the beautiful image that um, Pamela is like the kitten that's tangling the thread with the thread ball. And that to me feels beautiful because the whole idea of the pledge for me is I had a moment of insight when Penny asked me this question, said, so um, does the pledge mean someone has promised to give money or they've already given the money? And I was like, 
I did not make that clear. Hmm, I did not make that clear. And then as I was just feeling the unclarity in that particular moment, it occurred to me that the unclarity was the most beautiful part, which was totally an accident. Because the unclarity said, well, wait, that means any number of people could pledge together. You could find a thousand people at each give a dollar. And oh, it's the way of playing with it that is the co-creation. And it was in that moment that I saw what the pledge community was, not the pledge, the pledge community. It was we come together to figure out what we have together, to do together whatever we figure out we need to do together. And it's all playing. It's all just playing. I'm like, oh, this is definitely not fundraising, right? Like fundraising is a byproduct if it occurs at all. And then I saw the real beauty of the pledge community. And so, yes, keep breaking the model, Pamela. That's the whole point. <laughs> keep breaking it. <laughs> and we'll figure out what the heck it is. Playing with it. Um, and now I see Jonathan has his hand up. So Jonathan, I pass over to you. So um, you actually just you know, addressed a lot of the questions that I was going to ask, which had to do with um, uh, the pledge community meeting, because I missed that this morning. and I said to a note asking you if there was a recording. Um, but my immediate question was, uh, are you intending in this that uh, the thousand people who signed up to give a dollar each for one of these thousand dollar pledges would also be members of the pledge community and you know have some kind of a voice? And, and do they have to coordinate first before their representative or the person who got this organized can come and speak at these uh, community events? So that was my question. Yeah, and my answer to that is, we will only find out what the path looks like by making it as we walk it. And so the idea was simply, those who believe enough in this to say they're gonna put some skin in the game are the ones who will play the game. And that was actually something Rachel Olson was on the pledge call this morning. And yes, there is a recording. I just wanted to include the recording of this call first and then send them both out. So I'll upload them today and get them out. Um, but when Rachel said she felt she needed to put skin in the game and not only be someone who talks about it, almost everyone picked up that phrase from her afterwards at some point in the conversation. Almost everyone on the pledge call was like, I'm here because you know, I'm, I'm committing myself in some way to somehow being a part of it. And that it was really that act is what I think mattered. And I think of this as um, there are kind, different kinds of rituals and one kind of ritual is performative rituals, which is where you change reality through a performance. Probably the most visible example would be the, the wedding vows at a, at a wedding, that two people become like they transform as, as a dating couple to a married couple by saying I do. And the performance of that ritual is what makes them, what changes the social reality. For me, the stepping into a commitment to the pledge changes the social reality. And the money is something that happens somewhere further down the road. And that difference gives us the room to play with ritual. And so the pledge community is, a, if you want to think of it as a game of rituals, that's one way to think of it. There are many ways, but that's one. And that way of thinking is not untrue. It is true. There's just more than that. And so that's where we can play in this way. And so, yeah, Pamela, you said about all, ER, all volunteers in the ER put skin in the game on a daily basis. And what's different is the social naming of it in, in a recognized ceremonial space, which is we've created a space where the naming of the act changes the social significance of the act. And that's just a beautiful opportunity to use a cultural scaffolding of ceremonial processes, um, which is also game design and some of these other terms are getting at that same thing. And naming the structure to give social significance to the act makes the act meaningful within whatever that structure means. And so it's a framing of the, of the act. So now we can start to take those daily acts and give them significance in a different way. We can start to play with how we give them significance using ritual and ceremony. Um, but that's a whole other topic. I see that Jan has her hand up and I just wanna be mindful of the time because we're nearly at an hour and a half. So maybe after Jan, we'll do a wrap up if that's okay. So Jan, on to you. 
Yeah, I think uh, Pamela sort of raised it too. I just wanted to say that, you know, the difference between people that put in two hours and 40 hours a week into ER um, also is a huge, huge pledge that also needs to be recognized in a way. So just financializing, it feels it's missing something. So how do we acknowledge the different degree of um, huge amount of effort that some people put in and some people are not as much and we're working with that all the time. So this, I just needed to raise that because I feel the naming it as skin in the game as being only about um, financializing um, has some problems, but I also understand there's something that requires financializing, so. Yeah, thank you for that, Jan. I think um, one of the important things here is that the crisis that created the pledge community was the crisis of not having the money for Los Albercas. And then really the question was, it was like a social test. Who will actually put money into supporting Los Albercas? And there were two previous attempts before the pledge community, all within the span of two weeks, of a GoFundMe campaign, and then some other actions that began to take form, where we saw that almost no one in Earth Regenerators was financially supporting Las Albercas, and almost all the money was coming from people following me on Twitter, which actually has been consistent with all of the crowdfunding. The money to buy Ori Hindalagua brought people into Earth Regenerators even more than drawing money from within Earth Regenerators. And so there's this really interesting exploratory question. How do the on the ground opportunities and needs like Ori Hindalagua being, being rescued in the moment of that crowdfunding campaign, which gathered and formed the Bari Char um, Regeneration Fund work group, which co-created the context in which the crowdfunding occurred. But anyone who was in that work group and Penny was there would remember, I did all the crowdfunding. <laughs> Basically it was like, everyone was sort of my cheerleading squad and watching it. And the dynamic was fascinating to see how the existence of the work group empowered people following me on Twitter to want to be more involved and give money. And some of them joined ER and joined the work group. Well, some of them were already in ER doing other things. And then you end up finding this multi-directional causation where after a while you can no longer tell which thing is causing which, but they're all co-evolving together. And there's a way of managing the creativity as it occurs, which is sort of beautiful and ugly both at the same time. It's like really messy and really confusing and really dynamic and at the same time really inspiring, but only if it moves forward. And so we found that again with the ER fund when in December I did all the crowdfunding for the ER fund. And then the first week of, or I guess the second week of January was around the 10th of January. I provoked the ER fund governance group into a different action by saying, I think you guys need to give away $5,000 by the end of the month. And so again, there was this, it's not exactly chicken and the egg. It's like a chicken and the egg in both directions, which is why it gets really confusing. You look back and try and remember how it happened and it actually gets hard to remember. It's like, I'm not quite sure which one happened first because there was so much happening in those three days. And that's the absolute beauty of this is that this pledge community is gonna work in a similar way that initially most of the money that's come in was from people who are not really active in ER. Like, the first pledge, well, the first pledge was Rachel and the second was Jonathan, but that was before we actually did the pledge, pledge drive outwardly. We did the pledge drive outwardly, Antonio was the first one to pledge and then Gregory Landaway, and then a few others. Basically, the people who always support me <laughs> were stepping in, whether or not they were active in ER. And that creates this beautiful thing around innovation, just innovation always happens at the edges. And so we create edges. When we create edges, that's where the creativity occurs. And so by having the pledge community bringing in new energy from the outside, it was sort of galvanizing and catalyzing some existing energy in ER, which is helping it to change. But there you can't see which way the causation goes. It's like, which one caused which one? After a while, it doesn't really matter which one it was. It matters that they are brought into a tension of mingling with each other. And that good intentions are maintained long enough that during the times of confusion, we just get through to the other side. And having done a lot of crowdfunding, I know that it always happens this way, <laughs> um, but it's really hard to describe while it's happening. It's more like we construct incomplete stories around it afterwards, and, and they're always incomplete. So I'm just naming that we're dealing with real world complexity here, which is part of why this is so beautiful and why it's always, as Pamela said, 
I don't know what is going on, but I want to play this game. And I think that that humble mindset is so important in all of this. Like if anyone thinks that I know what I'm doing, they're going to misunderstand what I'm doing. <laughs> I know how to function in this level of confusion and be creative. And then I dance with the confusion in creative ways well enough after all these years that beautiful things happen more often than not. And they tend to accumulate. But that's very different from knowing what I'm doing. And, and it's really interesting how all of us are sort of doing that. Uh, but the more we enter into this tangle, as Mitty described it, the more we see we just need to play with the threads and forgive ourselves for unraveling some of it and congratulating ourselves for um, re-raveling some of it. And like Pamela said, remembering the tangle is beautiful too. <laughs> and notice how this is very much like shamanic trickster. That is not by accident. I just want to name that. It's very much not by accident that we're in the trickster archetype with all of this. Um, so I realize it's been long enough that maybe we should wrap up now and just let all of this percolate. Just let it keep percolating because I don't think it's going to get any less messy if we keep talking. Just like I don't think it'll be less messy next week. I think it's just going to stay messy. But if we have the right relationship to it, it'll become fun. It'll just be like we'll find the part that's fun to each of us. And, and eventually that'll work itself out too. Um, so I just wanna close by saying, um, thank you all for being here and staying in the messy tangle. And that I really feel that one thing that is about to become more coherent is the pledge community as a sandbox is about to become more coherent. That those of us who have been standing on the outside wondering if they should be in the pledge community will start to see what it's doing and then see that they wanna be a part of it or not. But until it started doing it, just you couldn't decide. And the other thing is that there will be people who will decide to come to Bari Chara in the next few months because of this container in time around a regenerative finance event in October. That that will also be a sandbox that'll start to reveal itself as whatever it is. And that will cause some people to want to come and some people to not want to come during this window of time. And that that's going to help clarify things. Um, but it, None of this is permanent. It's just we try to create dances of coherence for windows of time, and then it becomes incoherent again, and then it'll become coherent again, and then the dance just continues. And for me, that is a huge unlearning process. <laughs> huge. Oh my God, we're not going to figure it all out. But, um, but thank you all for being in the dance, and I'm looking forward to dancing more together. And I especially love the tenderness and delicateness of where these rubs create confusion and pain. Because those are exactly the places where we're gonna learn how to do this or not as we move forward. So just holding those places and recognizing how important they are is gonna carry us forward. Which is why I really appreciate that Mitty brought this in, that Pamela brought this in, that Jan brought this in, that those of us here in Barty Chara have been holding it for the last month in our own way. It's, it's messy and tender, and it's also really, really important. And so we're learning, that's for sure. And I thank you all for being in the learning together, uh, which makes it possible for this to feel good after the times it's really stressful and before the next time. <laughs> so thank you everyone, and I look forward to a lot more. And so um, I'll stop the recording now.